Hello, beautiful boss babes. Are you ready to chase life with Kelly? Well, I'm your host, Kelly Chase, and I'm so excited you're here. We are going to talk about all things love, dating, relationships, money mindset. We're going to dive deep into self-love, worthiness. I am going to bring on some incredibly empowering guests. We're going to have fun, we're going to laugh, and perhaps we're even going to shed some tears together. I am here to empower you, inspire you, and motivate you to create the life you crave. I am so excited for today's episode. Let's dive in. Awesome. Hello, beautiful listeners. Thank you and welcome back to the show. I have such an incredible guest on with us today. Um, I've been following this man's journey for quite some time now and just inspiring and, you know, just through my healing journey um, altogether, just really like diving into his content um, that he posted on social media. And um, yeah, it's just kind of like one of those things you've got to be, you know, if you're open to it, you're open to it. And when you are, it's, you know, as I've been going through my own like personal development and self-love journey and just like spiritual awakening journey altogether over the last four years, everything just lands even more and more every single time that I like consume your information. So, um, I, he actually reached out to me and, but he was on my list of people to have on the show. So I was so excited. <laughs> it was like this universal, like alignment It was beautiful, but I want to welcome to the show. I will be quiet and, um, introduce, uh, Ste- no, yep. I'm going to butcher it. Stefano Stefanos to the show. <laughs> and he can say his Thanks, name properly. <laughs> You did, you did, you did, you did great. You did great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kelly. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean, so he is a relationship coach or masculinity coach. And like, honestly, like I love his stuff because it's so vulnerable and so raw, um, like sex and intimacy surrounding uh, those topics. And yeah, I mean, can you share with us, you know, your journey, like how did you even get involved in this like what's your Mm. background what's your story how did you even become a relationship coach to begin with yeah yeah thanks thanks for asking that question and and it really um we've been asked that question a few times and it goes back to my experiences as a child and what i moved through and what i went through as a kid and for me, that was growing up in a in a household that was really challenging on many fronts. There was, there was violence there. There was volatility. There was, uh, you know, a- emotional and physical um, absenteeism from my parents, particularly my father. Um, you know, they were really stuck in their own trauma and their own pain. And as an adult, I can look back and go, wow, you know, they did the best they could. And there were some really great times and that was actually that added to the confusion as well right that added to the disorganization in my nervous system and in my in my own mind um but there's just there was a lot of frightening moments regular frightening moments and what i learned was that your relationships can be really really difficult i i remember uh dr john d martini once saying that our voids become our values and so what we were missing in life especially during our formative years in our early childhood um often becomes the thing that we crave and that we value the most as adults and so i value healthy relationships i i value connection and intimacy i value getting to know myself through others i value getting to know others through myself as well and like being in that dance with with different people in the world right whether it's my romantic partner my lover my friend my daughter uh my family members my parents uh you know strangers people that i've just met so i really i really crave that and and i crave that because i really didn't have a lot of that i felt very isolated and alone as a kid uh, basically because of that, that trauma that I was experiencing and the fear that was associated with that and the contraction in my physiology and in my psychology. And so as I grew older, I had this immense fascination with human connection, but also this fascination with, with human potential and how we can evolve and grow in relationships. And I started to put language to that and started to, to contemplate and reflect deeper on what what it means to be human essentially i'm not i'm not the first person to ask that question it's been asked for thousands of years if not a lot longer um but but it really it really captured me and intrigued me and then 
I, I began my journey. Um, I, I did a lot of traveling when I was younger in my, in my late teens and, and early twenties. I mean, in fact, I've traveled a lot, just a lot. It's a relative term. I've, I've traveled a fair amount throughout my years. It's one of my highest values as well. And I can, I can tether that back to why that is, but, um, I spent a lot of time mixing with very different people from different cultures. Uh, that, and, and that really intrigued me as well. Then I began studying psychology and behavioral science, um, philosophy at university later on. I didn't, I didn't get straight out of high school and do that, but I, I've always, almost always had this deep, deep fascination with people and relationships. And, mm -hmm. and I really, you know, immersed myself in the personal transformation, personal development world and personal development industry from a very young age, really from about 18. Um, but maybe more formally from 22. So I'm 40 years old now. So at 18 to 22 years, I've been in this space, you know, learning, growing, still very much learning and growing. Um, and it's just been a natural progression in terms of um, my service offerings and, and my coaching and the way that I, I work with people somatically and trauma informed and um, using various modalities. And, and I'm still studying, you know, I don't think that will ever stop. I'm still learning and growing. Um, but that's that's in brief, you know. That's that's part of my story there. I guess a, a really not. I guess I know a very important component to that has been my relationship to women, my relationship to sex, to intimacy, to the feminine, to my own core wounds and traumas, and how that's played out in so many relationships throughout my life. Uh, and that has been a massive driver. When I had a deeper awakening in my very early thirties, that was a massive driver for. Uh, I've got to look at my stuff a little deeper. I haven't been going deep enough. I've only been touching it. I've been really avoiding a lot. I've been scared. I've been in contracted states just like I was when I was a kid, but it was masked by false bravado and toughness and, mm. you know, machismo and, and, and so much um, and just distraction, right? Like I was an adrenaline junkie and I was, uh, you know, I was always looking for that high largely through sex. And so, I started to really work with these elements of myself. Um, I became even clearer on the path that I wanted to take and who I wanted to be in the world and more importantly, who I wanted to be for me. And I really just wanted to stop leaving a train wreck of, of disastrous relationships behind um, and stop being fake and false. There was a lot of infidelity, um, sex addiction, love compulsion, and just really working through uh, a lot of that and, and just growing through a lot of that has been a very interesting journey for me. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. What, you know, you said that it started kind of, you know, 18, around 18 years old. Were you introduced to someone or something that like gave you that nudge to seek further in, you know, go deeper within yourself or, you know, like, I mean, I know maybe, some people go through like therapy or, you know, they're doing something that, or they're, I don't know, they read a book and they like feel like, wow, there's something more to this. You know, like what was that for you that like calling that, Hey, I need to lean into this. Yeah. My, my curiosity, I, I perceived and felt my curiosity to be really stunted as a kid. And so as I became more autonomous and sovereign as a late teen and, and early, early twenties, I just, that curiosity just really flourished. And so Yes, I'd seen counselors and somatic therapists and therapists and coaches and shamans and, and spiritual healers from a very early age. My mother exposed me to a lot of that. Um, she was a little quote unquote witchy, if you like, you know. <laughs> so she was, you know, or quote unquote spiritual, whatever you want to, whatever word you want to use around that. But she was alternative in mainstream views and introduced myself and my younger brother, largely myself, because I was just really curious um, to really interesting people. And so again. It was my curiosity that peaked. And of course, all the people along the way and the courses and the immersive experiences, it all compounded and, 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 and continued to feed into this desire to uh, evolve, essentially evolve and grow and expand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The, you mentioned that, you know, you had, you know, you were like an adrenaline junkie and the high is what, you know, like chasing sex basically. And, you know, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that as far as like, you know, cause obviously there are listeners that, you know, they may not be aware that that's what they're doing. Um, as far as like using it to avoid the healing, mm. using it to avoid dealing with the stuff that we need to address that's going on inside yeah. of us. Yeah, sure. So for me, I, 
sex was a big crux. So if I, if I pull back a bit and talk a little bit about how we cope and deal with, with um, difficulty, right? And so we all have coping strategies. And as, as children, when we're developing these coping strategies in dealing with difficulty and challenge and pain and anything that's really uncomfortable, immensely uncomfortable, so lightly uncomfortable to immensely uncomfortable, we develop these patterns of behavior and they continue to morph and transmute and solidify in our physiology, in our neurology, in our psychology, in our emotional patterns, in our relational patterns. As adults, they often become maladaptive coping strategies, they don't really serve us, right? They, they're somewhat addictive. They're, it's all about avoiding that big pain, moving away from the fear. We're, we're not as self-aware. And if we remain in those circles or those cycles, I should say, we simply just keep circling and we just keep reinforcing those patterns. And, and, and as a result, usually as a byproduct, we're pushing people away. We're avoiding dealing with our stuff, which has us feeling fractured. We're not fractured, but we, we feel almost empty. And so we've got to keep filling up that, that void, right? Or we have to, you know, fix the, the, the perceived brokenness within ourselves. We don't feel whole. And at some level, physiologically, we're attempting to close loops on trauma. But these coping strategies don't cut it, right? And so for me as a kid growing up, as a little kid, sex wasn't in my periphery and it wasn't an option, but food was. So I use food as a crux. I use food as a way to feel good because the greater our pain or perceived pain, the greater pleasure we need to put back into our bodies and minds to feel in, in, in equilibration, to feel homeostasis. Mm -hmm. And so I would use food. I would spend time at my, grand, my maternal grandparents' house. I would watch TV. TV was another one. I'd watch movies that made me feel good. So as a kid, right? Now, as an adult or as a teen, you know, coming into puberty, hormonal flushes, coming into greater testosterone, being more attracted to women, I started to replace food with exercise. I was quite overweight as a kid. So exercise came in, uh, sex came in. And instead of using food oh, as a primary source or even t TV, I would use adventure and adrenaline and peak experiences and move away from routine, right? Like travel, go do, you know, climb mountains, whatever it may be, highly be highly competitive in, in any and every sport I could engage in, right? Because I was seeking a lot of validation. I was actually receiving a lot of validation and worth from mm -hmm. outside, from other people, institutions, etc. You know, oh, your first, your second, your third, whatever, um, from these activities. And so then, sex became particularly sex became this shadow element. I was I was doing it in the in the shadows. I was visiting prostitutes. I was, you know, one night stands, casual encounters. Um, you know, erotic massages, like it just, it wouldn't, I needed more pleasure. I needed more pleasure. And I couldn't see the forest through the trees. I thought it was normal. It's like, this is what guys do. Mm. Oh. So, you know, and not just guys, it's not just what guys, it's just what people do. It's what we right. do. It's just, we just don't, you know, we don't have to tell anyone what we do. It's our private lives, you know? And so again, like I trace that back, I look at how intimacy and love and, and even sexuality was educated, expressed, shared in, in my household. And it was, more like violence. You know, my parents would say the nastiest things to each other. And the interesting thing was my friends as a teenager, their parents, um, was, you know, you, there's European houses. I'm not saying that all Europeans are like this. I just grew up in a Greek Italian household, very fiery, very distant. And most of my friends were Italian and Croatian. And their parents, that generation was much the same. They weren't really connected. So I thought, oh, this is what marriage is like. This is what relationships are like, right? And so that's not true. But that was my perception. I just kept growing up with that and believing that and not questioning that. I wasn't testing and pushing boundaries in, in healthy ways and, and actually challenging my own ideologies. Mm. And A, I didn't know how to do that really well. And B, I just didn't want to because it was convenient to, to forget. It was convenient to shove away my pain. And all of these peak experiences that I was seeking were really about me pursuing uh, pleasure to avoid the suppressed and repressed pain and unresolved trauma from my childhood. Mm. And so I use these things as a, as a way to feel better about myself, but enough was never enough. And it, it became addictive. It became a compulsion. It became, I was reliant on this. Otherwise I'd feel very restless and I didn't want to feel restless because that restlessness reminded me of my childhood and the difficulty that I had in the disconnection with my parents and with myself. And, you know, peeing my pants because I was so scared of my dad when I was a little kid, hiding under the bed, hearing my parents fight, you know, receiving physical beltings uh, because 
I sneezed or said something that was out of place, you know, as a kid. I mean, what do you say that's out of place, right? But it, it was it was all of that. I didn't realize that. Like I have a tremendous awareness now and I've been in this space also, you know, we, we teach what we need to learn the most. And the more we teach, the better we become, the more proficient we become at a craft, right? And so I've been coaching people for many, many years and, and I'm constantly seeing myself in others and seeing others in myself. And so now I have an astute awareness around this, but it wasn't always like that. Hence the distractions, the coping strategies that were kept playing out. And I'll say one more thing and I'll pause. To be super clear and to be very open and transparent, you know, food still is a coping strategy for me. There's still an emotional tether to food. Now I've got it way under master, mastery compared to what I did, but there's still, there's still that element of, you know, I'll wake up in the morning and, um, I'll make sure I exercise and I exercise at intensity so I can justify eating some food. At some level, that still that, that belief still exists within me. Like I've, I've got to be worthy to receive that food, so I've got to work for it. I've got to put the effort in. And again, I know where that's tethered to. It's self-worth stuff with seeking dad's approval and validation and, and being bullied and other elements as well, right? Again, I'm, I'm aware of it. I can act differently with it. And because I've, I've – not that I've given up uh, – sex and i've given up but i i have moved on that relationship to sex and love and intimacy has changed massively so i don't i don't have this yearning to have sex with so many different women and do all this because i've i've really i really have closed that loop and healed that wound now it still plays a part in my life sure my relationship to it has shifted so much and if if i was to just use very simple language food and even television which i don't really watch a lot of television for that reason right um but food particularly is, is still that that saving grace it's still that oh that pleasure that i i'm i'm in control of still at some level right i can and i have an extreme personality so i can fast for days and days and days just on water and function super high wow. like highly functioning and i can gorge right and there's yeah. the extremes and so i, I play I, I i play in trying to find and do my best to find that homeostasis and not be in extremes. And, but I do enjoy fasting as a, as a side note, right? And part of it is because of the wound, but the other part is deep, deep curiosity for seeing where my body can go and what happens to the mind and what's happening to my, my whole constitution when I'm in, a, in an unfamiliar state of being. Yeah. I love that you keep using the word curiosity because it's such a, it's such a good word. <laughs> I mean, that's my... I guess my curiosity continues to, as you were saying too, it's like, you're never going to stop learning. You're never going to stop, you know, your journey and everything. Right. And that's it. It's like, you just become more curious and about different things and you want to go deeper or you discover something for the first time and you want to really expand on that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I I totally related. I was laughing when you were talking about the food because that was something over the last couple of years through mentorship um, we were actually talking about like money mindset and a um, coach and I, and she was like, you know, what are your, some of your behaviors with money? And I said, well, I feel like if I get like a lump sum, I not to say I'm like, going to go below it all, but I feel that like freedom to go, like I binge it. Right. And so she was like, where else in your life are you binging? And I was like with food. And so that's something too. And I, I like, I just had a birthday this past weekend and my parents left my birthday cake for me. That thing is gone. <laughs> I mean, there's no couple of bites here and there. It's, it is gone. And I'm like, but you know, I don't eat that type of food on a regular basis. I like, I'm pretty like disciplined in my lifestyle because it makes me feel better to just not eat mm. crappy foods. Right. Lucky. But I actually had this cake in my house and it was a, like a quarter of the cake. I mean, it was gone real quick. And I mean, I do that. Like I buy chips and I just like eat the whole bag in like a sitting. And so I'm highly aware of my behaviors with all of this, Mm. you know, but as you were saying, it's like trying to be the awareness, at least we have that, (laughs) you know, it's, that is the key to it all, but finding that balance and finding that homeostasis, as you mentioned, that is something that I'm, you know, probably going to be continuing to work on, but I think I've been that way my entire life. Like, you know, just from at a little age with around food, it was always, you know, you know, if my mom bought like some cookies or something and if I ate them, you know, my sister and I split it, we ate them all. She's like, well, that's enough. Like you're not getting any more. So, you know, it's like, 
I, I don't even know how to explain the behavior, but it's, I've been like doing those binging tendencies for a very long time. And, but, yeah. it, but it was neat to see how it showed up in like how I behave with money also. And mm. then looking at my dating life, I mean, I've just started to put these like two and this two and two together is like, you know, I am single. So like, but with everything going on with me, I have a tendency to like binge in that area as well. Like I go like really mm. heavy into like, okay, I'm going to like date, like it's almost like a season. Like, and I go and get on the dating apps and I'm like binging in the sense of like talking to people and going on dates. And then I like completely back off and I'm done. <laughs> it's really interesting how our behaviors are just really pretty connected. So. Yeah, very, very much. So. I like that you've, you've brought that up and I, I, agree with you there, there's this parallels across every areas of our life of our lives and awareness is the first step to transformation and integration is what's really key right it's like we can be if, if, if awareness was all we needed the world would be a very very different place right the, the the action and the integration and the persistence consistency and continual path that we move towards that's that's different to what was that's the integration piece right and when we when we integrate that at a, at a physiological level and at a mental level, emotional and spiritual, I would say too, that's when deeper transformation takes place. I I love the the pattern you've just recognised. May I may I comment a little bit on that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Oh, not to not to you know yeah, yeah. use you as a case in point, but just a really interesting <laughs> example. Yeah. So you know, I had an interesting experience last night that I was reflecting on this morning. So I was at dinner with a friend of mine. And we were ordering some food and we we didn't over order I, I don't believe we, I've, I've definitely can order a lot more than that we were at dinner and um the lady said oh would you you know do you want fries or onion rings with this thing or whatever it was and and i just said to my friend it's up to you and he's like he's like no i'm gonna put a stop on that like we're, we're ordering too much right and he was just being funny and so forth and i'm like yeah I, i'm good we don't need that but what happened in my body was interesting i felt contracted i felt back i'm like and I was reflecting on that this morning and I thought to myself, I was lacking freedom and control, right? Mm -hmm. So freedom was a really big thing for me growing up. Very, very controlled by my father particularly. And and I don't like when someone, and this guy's a dear friend, I'm only for like 15 years, he's here visiting, and he didn't mean anything by it. And he was just fun he was just being playful right but my body it's i noticed what was happening in my body my body just went literally went back and i didn't like that and what i really understood was what i didn't like about it was that someone was making a decision for me and telling me what i can and can't do mm. right well that's how i interpreted it. he wasn't saying that of course but that's how i interpreted it right. and i started really looking at that in a deeper way now troll piece so when your mum said hey that's enough Maybe it wasn't enough for you back then. Maybe you wanted to have an extra cookie. Maybe you didn't want to have the extra cookie, but you wanted the option to have it or to make right. your own mind up about it, right? right. Your mm -hmm. autonomy, your, your sense of freedom. Now, you compound those experiences and mum interacting with you that way over many, many years, right. right? It makes sense that you're attempting to control mm -hmm. and maybe even through a rebellious sense of self. Like eating that cake is somewhat rebellious. Like I'll show you, I can do what I want. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, yeah, I'm going to date for three months and then I'm going to stop it. Okay. <laughs> right? I have control. So it's, it's, yeah, well, that, that's it. So, so the tether that, or the string that you pull, right, is, or the thread that you pull is that one of control and you start going deeper into control. Mm. You start understanding how control shows up in your life, where it shows up, what's underneath the control, what's the fear it's moving you away from, what's the contraction there, what's the core wound or the source of that, where's the repetitive nature of that really show up? Okay, it shows up in food, it shows up in dating, it shows okay, well, wh where and how, and what are the feelings in, in within, and what was what's been repressed and suppressed? Like these are the explorations, these are the curiosities, right? And it's going into this. And going deeper and following these rabbit holes down and making it i don't want to say making it a game because it can somewhat be serious and, and sometimes painful but also making it fun and light to the point where there's this surrender and acceptance to you know what if i want to grow if i want to change if i want to evolve then naturally there's going to be some tension that i experience in life that's life let me accept that let me actually be okay with that 
And when challenge comes, because I'm deliberately exploring some uncomfortable things within me, okay, I'm going to welcome that challenge. I know it's impermanent. I know it won't last forever. Mm-hmm. I know I'm going to be okay. And with that gnosis, that deep, deep embodied wisdom and understanding, it allows us to lean in a little more, expand our window of tolerance. I have a coaching institute, Elementum Coaching Institute, with my wife and another couple. And one of the key principles we teach around somatics and trauma and moving through our issues is learning to expand our window of tolerance of what we can literally tolerate through edging, right? Through, And I'm not talking about sexual edging. I'm talking about psycho, emotional, spiritual edging, right? Like taking ourselves to the edge of what's really uncomfortable, staying there a little bit, and then learning to re-regulate our nervous systems. <sighs> Having a real life experience of, oh, I just took myself to somewhere that's really uncomfortable, maybe a little unsafe, but I've been able to create safety in my body again. So next time I do that, I'll go a little further and go a little further. And it's in that going a little further that we discover more about ourselves. And then with that knowledge, we're able to make changes. Mm-hmm. But knowledge without the ability to make change can be really, really fucking frustrating, actually, because then we have all this awareness and it's also confusing and deceiving because we have all this awareness, all this knowledge, and we think because we have the knowledge that we're making the changes, but we're not unless yeah. we make the changes. Mm-hmm. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the fun part of growth. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like raising my hand. I'm like guilty, guilty of that. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's interesting because I feel, and I know that I heard this, you know, years ago when I first started to invest in coaches and mentorship and, you know, it's kind of like we get to, I got like obsessed with mentorship and learning and discovering more and, and all of that. And my coach that I, um, I guess about six months ago, we stopped working together, but that was like one of the last things that she told me. She was like, I remember like you're here to learn and grow and evolve Mm -hmm. and expand not to fix you. We're not here to fix you. There's nothing wrong with you, you know? And I want to remind you, she just kept saying like, I want to remind you that because I think that you have been kind of stuck in this pattern of investing in a lot of people. You have a lot of knowledge now, like go use it, go embody it, go be it. And go fucking shine your light, you know, like, she's like, you don't need any more, anyone else to fix you. Like, you're fine. You're good. (laughs) You know, but it was like, I did get caught up in that. But so with that being said, it's like, yes, like I'm in this place now. I'm like, I am so ready to like, I feel like I could just like explode with all the like teachings that I have consumed over the last four and a half years. And it's funny, because when you were talking about edging, I knew exactly what you were talking about, because of one of my first coaches about something that she teaches on now, like about somatics and, and just edging and just slowly making that expansion mm. um, in like regulating your nervous system and all of that. So it's stuff that I am, I'm learning about right now, actually yeah. um, to do that within myself. Cause I think that that's been that what you were talking about, like how your gut, you felt that in your body when your friend was like, no, we don't need that food or whatever. It's like, yeah. I recognize those sensations now. I mean, I have some family issues and whenever there's like heightened voices, like my gut contracts and I'm like, scary. This yep. is like, I don't love this place. <laughs> my, inner, my little child, my inner child is like, mom, don't yell. Sister, don't yell. We don't need loud voices right now. <laughs> yeah. so it's really yeah. interesting to now be like even hyper aware of really yeah. paying attention to like the actual body and what the body is feeling. Yeah. And, and I, I love that you have that awareness and I'm even wondering, you know, the sort of the, the, the evolution of that for you could be in really compassionate, non-judgmental ways and, and vulnerable ways. And this requires courage and heightened levels of self-worth, but to almost say, Hey, um, can we keep the voices down? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, um, activating or triggering or upsetting me and, or, or like being really honest, Hey, it's reminding me of A, B and C, um, I'd really appreciate if we could keep, you know, the, the voices down. And if that is really difficult, um, then maybe I'm just going to leave. Yeah. Like that type of, you know, like that type of level of honesty. It's a really then, you know, now we're moving into deeper integration because you're you're setting healthy boundaries. Right. You're, you're taking ownership. You're voicing what was uh, unvoiced so many so many years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, one thing I I have been, you know conscientiously working on is 
not allowing the activation and the triggers to, uh, you know, have me react versus respond. And, you know, mm -hmm. like, okay. It, because I don't like the person that I become in those moments. You know, if I like retaliate with like a loud voice or I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and, and kind of like lash back out. Um, but I mean, there was a situation that happened yesterday and my mom had to like, Hey, did you do this? And I, you know, whatever, she had sent me like a message to take care of something like a month ago. And I didn't, I was like, mom, I got so much stuff going on. I don't like, I, whatever. And she got like angry and like, just yelled mm -hmm. like on the phone. And I was like, what is the loud voice about? Like, why are we yelling mm -hmm. at me? I was like, I'm not five. We don't need to No, that's not okay. <laughs> but what was the response to that? Well, she was just like, she goes, well, I just, you know, hate taking care of everybody's stuff. And I'm like, well, then stop. <laughs> then don't. Like, I'm an adult. If I, don't, if I don't take care of something, then that's on me. You know, it was like paying a parking ticket or something like that. And I was yeah. like, I was like, that's on me. And she, she goes, yeah, but you've asked me for money before. So, like, it's, it falls on me because if you're not in a place to, like, pay the thing and I have to take care of it. And I'm like, No you don't have to, you're, you don't have to, I'm a big girl, I'm a big girl, but I was like, so like, I understood, but I understood like where she was coming from. However, I think that I did allow myself to get a little, um, overheated myself. Like I mm. didn't say it in a more calm manner. It was mm. like, what's all the yelling about? Like it was still like <laughs> my matched hers in a sense. So, yeah. you know, but so it was just something over the last 24 hours I've been thinking about, okay, how could I have handled that differently so that I wasn't matching, but I could like, you know, come, come at it with more of like a groundedness and just like help her see maybe, but then I don't know, maybe that's me trying to control the situation there too. <laughs> Great there awareness. <laughs> <laughs> Great awareness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was interesting, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very fascinating though. I mean, just this work in general, I mean, it's, it's neat. I mean, I love, like you said, just using the word curiosity. I love exploring more mm. things while also understanding when I need to really use all the teachings and the knowledge that I do have and create a balance of creation and consumption within mm. what I do too so yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. hey, okay so i wanted to ask you um yeah you said you're married and i'm familiar with your wife as well um with her work too um how did you after you know obviously like through everything that you did you know all of your courses that you went through mentorship everything your your own life experiences how did you like when did you get to a place of like, okay, now I can actually commit and I'm not chasing this over here and I'm not succumbing just to like having sex or whatever. So yeah, that. yeah, probably a few years ago, mm -hmm. around a few years ago after, you know, a f few years of really deep work, I, 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 I stopped many of the businesses that I was involved in. I, I, I went into quite a lot of debt because I, I, really channeled all my cash flow and what I had um, and bad credit card debt into, again, I, I mentioned I have an extreme personality. So I went all in. I went all in on my growth and all in on everything. And, and I did. I, I got into a lot of debt. Now, thankfully, as part of that process, I, I trusted where I was. And, and it was dark sometimes. A lot of the time it was very dark. There was a, a fair amount of suicidal ideation. There was some really, really dark place. Like I went very, very, um, I went in to visit all facets of who I was and I was willing to do that. And I did that for a number of years. And as a result of that, um, you know, again, got myself into a lot of debt, but created a lot of awareness around that and clarity and, and acumen, not just about life, but all about about business because that transferred and translated to, to life so you know got out of debt a number of years ago um or unhealthy debt i should say and and really just started living from a more empowered place and not from a place of victimhood and suffering 
mm. and a, not from a place of uh, this is out of my hands. It's out of my control, right? And not not sense in in the set not control in the sense of uh, coming from a, a wound that I need to feel safe by being in control in every aspect of my life, but more so can surrender to this like it's out of it's literally out of my hands so there's no point in attempting to create a stronghold on something that i have no stronghold over mm. right i don't need so what, what essentially happened is i started being less hyper vigilant and felt safer in my body mm. and so i didn't need to control everything i didn't need to know everything uh, and that that really helped me shift as well and so you know i made the vast i would say the bulk of my deep work not to say that i have not experienced deep work since i've met christine right. since i've become a father that's the biggest initiation fatherhood wow. um but the, the the foundations were really laid before i met my wife before i even knew she existed right in in that in that physical sense uh which worked well for me and she had done the same in her own life journey yeah. And so we were able to meet in a place where we had done enough inner work. And when we first met, we were arrogant in the sense that, oh, we've done so much work, we're going to be fine, this is going to be great, bullshit. You know, honeymoon period was over very quickly and our stuff came up. And, you know, we, we, but we worked through that and we committed to being with each other and we could see the way through, albeit very challenging at times. Mm -hmm. But it was that, that inner solo work that we did, I believe, uh, and I'm fairly certain of that really got us to a place to be able to be more present to each other and each other's wounds and, and be more compassionate and be more open and more, and, and you know, less judgmental, uh, and more available to ourselves and to each other. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, what do you say to, you know, your, your clients and, and my listeners, like for those who are, whether they're in relationships or trying to attract those relationships and where, you know, that doesn't happen. The other person isn't doing the work and they don't understand the work and all that, you know, I mean, for me, like, I always think to myself, I'm like, I'm like, I'm attracting someone who is emotionally connected and who is doing this type of work because I don't think that I could attract anyone different because if they're not doing this work or open to doing this work, I, it's just not going to, it, it won't work. <laughs> I just don't think that that would ever work, you know, but it's, I, I mean, people have been like, well, you know, kind of going back to that whole like fixing and, you know, you're not broken thing. Like people don't want to think that they're like broken. Well, mm -hmm. I don't need to work on myself. I'm not broken, you know? And it's like, well, no. And I'm sure that there are guys out there for me who maybe aren't doing, you know, haven't dived into courses and all that stuff, but like, I feel like the guys that I'm wanting to attract would be open. Like, Hey babe, like I want to do a sex and intimacy course, like, but with us like together. And if they're like, no, it's not for me. I don't know if I would be okay with that. <laughs> I'd be like, no, I want you to, because it's not, not to fix us, but for us to grow and expand and just be better at it, at love, you know? But I know that there's yeah. so many people that, you know, that that's not ever I don't know. They're with, they're even married and, you know, they've been married for 10 years and their husband doesn't do anything, you know, but they're on this personal growth journey. So what are your thoughts around that? Like, could that still work? Yes, it can. Um, if so, the, the sim simplicity of it is this, if your highest values is personal growth and growing together and your partner is against that in any expression and capacity, and they are, that is a non-negotiable for you, it would be very difficult to work. Yeah. If it is a high value for you, but it's not a non-negotiable, and there are other elements of the partnership that give you grace, that give you, that feed you in whatever way it feeds you in, in a non-harmful, unsustainable, trauma-bonded way, right. right, to clarify that, then the relationship can work. Mm. Most of the time I will see that it won't. If someone really values growth, <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, small shit. <laughs> yeah, if they really value growth, yeah, it's usually a non-negotiable, which means that they have to compromise themselves. And most people don't want to do that. And, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't compromise who you are to contort yourself to be in a relationship. It doesn't fit. Right. And so most of the time, 
both partners really need to be committed to growth. They need to be committed to that journey and they need to value it. And, and, and they then grow together instead of growing separately. That's my response to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. I definitely agree with you. And that's what you and your wife did. You, after you said, mm. you said after the honeymoon phase, you worked together and worked on things. Mm. Um, mm. What, okay, you, as far as like the honeymoon phase, I, I, this is something that, like I said, that like s- a sensation in my body kind of get activated when people say, oh, like, you know, after the honeymoon phase, like it's, you know, it's like all downhill from there or whatever. And I'm like, I don't want to believe that story, you know, with the person that I'm supposed to be with, I want to be in a honeymoon phase for the rest of my life. Like, can, you know, is that possible? (laughs) Um, Not, not really. And you, and you sort of don't want it to be possible, right? Uh, See, we're, we're addicted to the honeymoon phase because it's a polarized state. Uh, right it's uh, it's it's we have the blinders on we can only see the good in the person it's it's right. idealistic but um, it doesn't last and once once the hormonal flush settles because that's a very real thing physiologically that's what's really impacting our blinders and the in the limerence phase it's known as or the honeymoon period once that settles down that's when the stuff comes to the surface more more whole versions of self are presented that aren't pleasant sometimes that are uncomfortable that are undesirable and it's working through those that brings you back into homeostasis and back into connection and intimacy and the, the, the love and the connection, the joy and the excitement that you share. It's just a different version and different shade of that. It doesn't mean that you can't have fun and play just because you're out of the honeymoon period. It doesn't mean that fun and play and excitement and spontaneity doesn't exist. It just exists in different ways. Mm-hmm. Most of us get addicted to those honeymoon periods. And, and when, when shit hits the fan, when it gets real, right, we, remove ourselves way too early without learning the lesson. So we just keep repeating that. So it could be after a year, it could be after two years, it could be some honeymoon periods the last a few years, not, they're not just a few months or a few weeks, right? Most are in that sort of six to 24 month range, I guess. It, it depends though. But once that phase moves, you want it to move. That's the idea. That's the growth in relationship, right? Getting stuck in a fantasy about, um, what what a relationship is isn't healthy. And again, I want to be really clear here. I'm not I'm not trying to rain on anyone's parade. Um, you can still have fun and play and joy and spontaneity and excitement outside of the honeymoon period. It's just a different. It's a different level of intimacy and connection. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll take that with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Exactly. Like I I want to ensure that play and intimacy continues and that we are again just growing together and you know helping each other just become better humans and you know we have children and all that so it's just like maybe it's that playful curiosity that i will be yearning to have in my relationship Mm, mm. that'll be fun (laughs) (laughs) um okay so a couple of questions um one in particular um so i have i don't want to say like i have a personal like like sex and intimacy issue but i know that i do in a sense um Mm -hmm. like i just learned to orgasm like a few years ago and sorry to organize what yeah i just i just learned how to like self-please like a few years ago right Yep. I've never had an orgasm during sex or any other like partner, anything. Yep. And it's, you know, a part of me is like, okay, well, like, do I need to go to a sex, like have like a specialist or like a sex therapist or someone like that, that or go on like a sex retreat or something. And is that going to be like the key to like opening me up? Obviously I'm sure that there is some type of energetic or emotional blockage happening, but is it like, do I have to do that in order? Or is there somehow, like, is there some type of like communication that is needed between me and that partner for me to be able to like with a partner where, because I'm like, well, I'm not broken. Like I'm able to do it by myself, but like not with the partner. So there's something. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think it's an either or situation. Yeah. Uh, And firstly, I really, really appreciate your vulnerability and openness. That's, that's amazing. I think that there really supports other people because it's very common that uh, particularly women struggle to orgasm or be in that state of pleasure with other people 
and there, because there are so many different reasons for that, but essentially, you know, pent up trauma, blocks, trust issues, intimacy issues. Um, the, the so many have been hurt by previous partners and haven't recovered from that, mm-hmm. and that that genital brain connection and the emotions that because as it runs through the heart and the emotions that are trapped and stunted because of that it it almost puts us in this freeze position particularly women i should say more so right so what you're experiencing i just want to normalize is very very common not to minimize your experience but to let you know that you're not alone i I do believe working with the right the well-aligned love intimacy sexuality coach trauma-informed coach somatic coach Mm -hmm. can help you unlock that pleasure even at a deeper level with yourself and with someone else Mm -hmm. i think you're very accurate when you say do i need to communicate with my partner absolutely i think that's that's a big part of but that's also really really scary i don't know what your history is but if you have a history of as a child communicating and it being shut down in any capacity or not being valued or being ignored or not being appreciated, that can be really difficult to express your truth because it comes at a risk of rejection or abandonment or, or humiliation. So, you know, working with someone and working on those parts of you to raise your self-worth can be very helpful when communicating. Because remember, when we're communicating with someone else, their pain bodies also in the mix, their joy bodies in the mix, but their pain bodies in the mix as well. And so you may say something that's not really you coming, it's coming from you, sorry, but it's not really you attacking them, but they may interpret that as a threat and they then attack you. And we do, we do this unconsciously, right? This is how we play out our fences. So yes, communication is key, but sustaining the communication and being calm and, and compassionate and loving whilst also setting healthy boundaries and, and knowing owning your no's and owning your yeses in that, exploring, experimenting, but you have to feel safe in your body with that partner. Mm-hmm. And, and, and when we're talking about masculine feminine polarity, the way to uh, you know, pleasure and safety, generally speaking for the feminine, is through the heart. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's really connecting at that level. And so what, what do you need to feel safe in partnership in sexual intimacy with someone else that helps you open more and surrender more and, and soften more, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's not a question you have to answer right now. This is, this is a deeper exploration, right? Yeah. Because, and, and, and commending you for feeling safe with yourself that you can reach deeper levels of pleasure, right? Because again, many people can't do that either. Right. Mm. including men like men need porn or mm. need you know, mainstream porn or need uh, intense external visual stimulus or, or auditory stimulus or a combination of both to you know ejaculate or quote-unquote orgasm right and again we're just talking about a very simple kind of orgasm we're not talking about a full body orgasm we're not talking about internal orgasms we're not, we're not talking about non-ejaculatory orgasms like there's so many layers to this right and let's like, keep I, a simple- I experience all that <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And <laughs> safety is the key. Yeah. Like healing all that past stuff where you can be in a place where you can ask for what you want, where you can ask your partner for what they want, where you can explore these concepts and, and, and speak to your fantasies and your ideals and what is a no-go zone for you and what you're willing to experience at this point in time and what you're not like. All of that, that, that comes from courage and confidence, but that courage and confidence is vested in doing your inner work, right? Yeah. And so, you know, to answer your question again very directly, I think it's a both and and multiple approach scenario. Uh, but you've got to start really learning to feel safe in your own body. And I think you've already started that process. I think you're at a point in your life where you want to deepen that process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really do. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, there was there there was an incident um, mm-hmm. where I was encouraged by a guy he was like you know oh you know get out your toy and like we play you know whatever and so i did and it was like it can take me a little while to to orgasm and by myself but like he's laying there next to me and stuff and i was like that's awesome and he like encouraged that and he feels safe and and to whatever level of confident that okay like i can't do it but i'm fine with her doing that you know like having a toy Anyways, but it was taking a while and all of a sudden he just like took the toy out of my hand, put it down and was like, kind of like, okay, it's my turn. 
I was like, I sat up and I was like, are you, did you just stop me from pleasuring myself? Like what? <laughs> and I was like, I was probably almost there. And he was like, but it's taking a long time. It's yeah, just, that's that's long. and I was like, bro, I was like, don't ever do that again. Like I got so irritated. I was like, don't ever do that again. I, that's not okay, you know? Please but, tell me you're not dating this person still. No, I'm not. No, 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 no. But I was just like, oh my God, did you just do that? <laughs> I was so ill, but, you know, there was a level, and I mean, I'll say this, like, it is stuff that I'm working on because at that time, like, yes, I get ill about it. While also, I probably wanted to have a deeper conversation about it, and I didn't. Mm. It was more yeah. like, I mean, I did tell him, I was like, I go, you just made me feel like there was something wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with me. Like, I know well, that there's something that I need to work on, yeah. but you just made me feel like I was broke. Well, let's, let's actually, let's go a little deeper in that, right? So firstly, sexual shame is a big thing and judgment is a big thing when it comes to sexual intimacy. And you need to remember that no one made you feel that way. Right. You, you felt that way based on a series of events. Now I say that not to demonize you, to not victimize you and empower you because at some level, unconsciously and consciously, you chose to feel like something is wrong with you. Right. And I would say that's an old, that's an old thing, right? right? That's an old, old, old thing. The, 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 the power there that you can, you know, gain for yourself is the, the knowledge and awareness around that's his conditioning. That's his immaturity. That's his pain. And I should, I should correct myself on something when I said, I hope you're not dating him still. What I really needed to say was, I hope you're not dating him still in the same way that you were relating then. Because that could, that could be a tremendous learning opportunity for you both where he sees his stuff and he sees his selfishness or he sees his impatience or he sees his addiction to ejaculation or mm -hmm. he sees his uh, you know, self-absorbed nature where he doesn't want to be present to your pleasure and so forth or whatever that may be. And that could be a tremendous learning opportunity. So I just want to correct myself there on that one. And, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, the, he can't make, no one can make us feel anything. I, I always revert, I always go back to um, Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning. Have you read that book? Mm -mm, no. So he's, he's essentially a psychiatrist slash psychologist in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. Okay. Pretty sure he was Polish, Polish Jew, potentially. I could be wrong. I, I can't remember. Please don't quote me on that. But either way, long story short is – He's witnessing death and destruction. He survives, by the way, destruction, everything. You can imagine to some degree what it would be like to be in a Nazi concentration camp in wartime. Yet he, you know, he's, 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 he's dying, food deprived, all of that. Yet his, inter his premise is they cannot take away what's in here. They can't take my mind. And so we can't. If we allow people to make us make us feel a particular way, we're giving our power away. Yeah. Now, can I can I completely see how you would have felt retracted and embarrassed and angry and irritated and shame and all those things? Like that's really uncomfortable. That's a really abrasive thing to do in the middle of something that's so fucking vulnerable and raw, right? right. That's why I was like, ugh, when you said that, yeah. I was like, oh man, that's fucking intense. That's harsh. And so, you know, unless he's really willing to grow out of that, probably not the right guy for you. And I acknowledge you for acknowledging what you could have done a little more, but I also acknowledge you for, you know, being in your truth too. Yeah. And irrespective of what happened after that, well, not irrespective, I'm hoping that you then shut that down and, yeah, good. Because that is you taking action in the world saying, I value myself more than this thing right. that's happening right here. And it had nothing to do with his pleasure or your pleasure. Had to do with presence. Mm -hmm. had, to, had to do with with uh, allowance and intimacy, and right. trust. And that trust was broken in that moment massively. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it, to, especially to 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 rip to rip the you know to to stop you physically stop you. Mm -hmm. That's that's not that's not healthy behavior. No, no. I was like, oh my god. I mean, yeah, I was not not yeah. okay. <laughs> No. <laughs> definitely not not okay with that situation um no thank you for that 
Um, what, okay. So I want you to explain more on like masculine and feminine, like divine masculine and feminine energy. I feel like a lot of people don't understand. I mean, I didn't even know, I didn't really know these concepts or hear of this language until five, four and a half years ago. So, I mean, I'm sure that there's listeners out there that don't either. They're like, what is this? And they, um, when I do, I I've mentioned it a couple of times, like on through social media and I've had people be like, they think it's gender, you know, based. And I want to correct that. So can you, I'm not an expert in it. Can you correct sure. Sure. <laughs> sure, sure. Explain it a little bit more, but like also how it is used, how we can use it more, yeah. in, you know, everyday life, but also intimately. Yeah, it's a very it's a very deep conversation and one that's that's highly multifaceted and and also somewhat controversial in today's world in today's society of um, being a hyper PC culture as well and also the changes that we're experiencing um, as a society as well, right? So, firstly, masculine feminine energy is not necessarily tethered solely to biological sex, males and or females, right? Um, there, there is a connection to that when we when we look at our uh, our evolution historically, physiologically, and how we developed behavior and attributes and characteristics vested in the um, things that we did from a very early age, like millions of years ago, right? And how we related to each other and the tasks that we that we did in the world, right? And what we were responsible for in groups for our survival. There is an element of that, um, but if we put that aside for a moment, we, when I say put it aside, I don't mean ignore. I mean just park it for a second we're looking at just energetics we're looking at duality right and so we learn through contrast as human beings really well and so we can also replace the terms masculine feminine with and and, and michaela bond speaks to this with go and flow energy mm -hmm. um do and be energy active passive energy yin yang um so we can look at it that and we can look at how that resides within every single human being okay so it's a human construct first and how that then plays out. Now, culture, society, um, uh, collective values, collective ideals, collective beliefs influence, you know, what becomes a, a dominant energetic in our society and, and, and which maybe biological sex holds more of that than the other. Um, that's, again, a super complex conversation. Happy to go there, but I think in time, we pro for the sake of time, we're probably not going to have that level of depth. But you know, we do see in our society that more masculine values or masculine characteristics are, are valued more. And, and that's an imbalance, right? Because you can't have one without the other. That's the, the purpose of duality is we, we learn in contrast and in reference to the other thing. Like you can say up, but what does up mean without down? Right. right? Like that's, you know, so you can say that's wrong, but well, then what is right if that's wrong? Right. And so it's it's not a it's not a better than masculinity and femininity or go and flow energy is two wings of the same bird, mm. two sides of the same coin, and and the coin and the bird being the whole being, right? Like the human yeah. construct. And so I don't really get caught up too much in the, we, we, you know, to be honest, when when people start saying, oh, that's that's so cisgender or that's heteronormative of you to say that. I'm like, oh, I think, you know, maybe I need to do a better point and make a better effort in explaining myself or really making those connections. But generally how I explained it then is, is how I explain it. It's really not solely connected to biological sex. Like I get um, the issues or the, the contentions or the conversations around identity uh, and so forth, but they're connected to that and they're also separate conversations as well, right? So, you know, when, when I when I look at these, uh, energetics, I just look at harmonizing these energetics within us as individuals. So if you have a greater propensity to be quote unquote, na I say quote unquote naturally because na nature is a byproduct of nurture and there's also an element of nature in that separate conversation. But if you have a greater propensity to be more in your masculine energetic, it serves you to actually really practice healthy ways of expressing that. And by default, that actually activates the feminine energetic within you, which which almost, I don't want to say equalizes, but creates greater harmony in your being. And it's not a 50-50 thing either. It doesn't have to be a 50-50 thing. It's mm -hmm. about knowing when to be in, in which energetic. So, for example, like if we look at active and passive, you look at, okay, when do I have to, and, and all action is action. So non-action is action as well, right? But you look at, okay, when do I need to be really productive and when do I need to rest? That yeah. could be considered masculine, feminine, energetic. Right. But that doesn't mean that rest is worse 
than 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 being active and taking action, being busy and being productive and and consuming. But in our collective society, we value that more. Oh, the person that works harder and works more hours and has more money and accumulates more, as opposed to the person that's resting, is mm. wrong. Uh, is is better. Sorry, the person that's resting is wrong. But these are extreme examples that we're using. Anything in extreme is not good. The person that's hyper busy and validates him or herself through excess and through activity and through accomplishment and achievement, which are masculine constructs, that's not healthy. And the person that has no motivation, no inspiration to be in the world, that's not healthy either. Right. And these are extreme shadow versions of the, the, the go and the flow energy or the masculine and the feminine energy, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, I think using other terms outside of masculine and feminine, A, becomes less confusing yeah. and, and B, allows us to actually look at it through a more neutral lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. I think the, I think what can relate to a lot of people is more of that, like the doing being, uh, because that yeah. was, and I say that because that was my story. I mm. was radically in a very masculine, unhealthy, masculine energy of, I mean, I worked multiple jobs. I mean, I can say I still work multiple jobs, but I'm doing it in a different place now. And I've, because I've learned about this. So I will disconnect. I'll go for a walk. I'll have a little dance party. I'll like just lay on my couch and meditate for 30 minutes in between things. If I'm feeling overwhelmed or like I'm going to get burnt out because I've, I've had burnout. I've had adrenal fatigue. Like I know where that, you know, all this do, do, do culture, it, you know, everything works together and you will find yourself in burnout at some point. Like it's just like not, it's not healthy. Um, so, you know, that's something too, like with, a lot of women who are in their masculine energy flipping the switch, you know, as far as like the intimacy goes, um, I have had conversations with women who again are, are very in their masculine because of like what they do. They're, you know, executives or sales leaders or whatever. And then not understanding how to get into their feminine when they're home and around their partner and, you know, not just, you know, just cooking dinner or whatever, but just being more in their feminine and allowing when they've been in more of the control state the entire day, yeah. you know? So yeah. can you speak to that? Like how, how to help people or how people, yeah, in general, I guess, because there's men that do this too, but <laughs> again, it's not necessarily gender, but I feel like a lot of women do this. Um, they're just like very in that, like I'm doing and doing and doing. And then I don't know how to turn off the doing switch when I get home. Cause I got to yeah. do all the things now and I got to cook the dinner and take yeah. care of my kids and yeah. all that. So how do they flip Yeah. It? I mean, the, the work around that is really going to the source of where the doing comes from, where the needing to prove oneself comes from, comes from through taking action, right? And so when we look at the source of that, and it could be a core wound from needing to impress dad or mom or, or being a high achiever or a perfectionist, and that's compounded over years, like really looking at that and, and the tether that that's attached to and healing those original core wounds can be very, very helpful in relieving the pressure of needing to perform right and needing to be a certain way and then internal internalizing or internally sourcing our self-worth and our approval right that can be really empowering as well but that's a process surrounding yourself with people that see you that can call you forward and say hey i see you doing a lot why what's going on there you know how about this or what about slowing down or what would slowing down look like, like asking key questions is always helpful you know working with a coach or a therapist or a guide, someone that can also, you know, call you, call us on our bullshit and, 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 yeah. and bring us forward, like pull us forward and help us make those changes and, and create habit changes in our lives. Like there's many techniques, but really working with the core wounds where that needing to perform is attached to. Mm, yeah, that, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. I didn't feel um, like I wasn't seen, I guess unless mm. I was doing certain things, you know, mm. it was kind of like, well, when I'm doing this, people know who I am. When I'm doing this, mm. people celebrate me. So it was That's kind right. of like that. Yeah. Combination. Yeah. A big part of its, a big part of its identity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so good. What, um, one last question and then we'll wrap up. Um, what happens in, you know, dating, I guess, like when people are not committing, like why, why will, I mean, obviously for a, a man to a woman kind of thing or whatever type of relationship, but yeah, like what is the non-committing, not prioritizing? Is there, I mean, I understand 
I read a book one time that I don't remember whose book it was, but it was just like, you know, men in particular, they want to feel secure and that you're, you, you're not taking from them. You're not like going to strip them of their joys and their passions per se. And so you have to, as a woman, um, help them see how you're like an added value basically versus yeah. that you're going to be taking things away. And that's why guys, uh, guys have a lot of like commitment fears, I guess, because they feel like their life is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some, some, some will. Yeah. I, I hear that. Some, some definitely will. So the, the fear of commitment piece can be connected to so many different things, right? Again, most of the ideas and the beliefs and the ways of being that are, that we, that we expel and express as adults are formed or, or created during our formative years. Right. Mm -hmm. And so going back to understanding where our fear of commitment comes from is really useful. Was our freedom taken from us? Were we restricted as children? Were we reprimanded a great deal? Did we grow up in a society that valued freedom so much? Did we form ideas and ideals around what freedom looks like for us? You know, for me, freedom meant, having sex with whoever I wanted, whether I was in relationship or not, that was freedom, being able to travel and do what I wanted to do, right? Having money was part of that. Um, but really it was my ability to make my own decisions and, and, and not be controlled, right? And so, you know, was someone, did someone experience physical abuse or sexual abuse where their power was taken from them? Because that, that fear of commitment can be sometimes tethered to that and tied to that as well. When we're looking at dating and relationships, it's really about finding that it's not balance. That's not the right word, but finding that, that place where we feel free because freedom is different for everyone, right? How they define free and, and, and also being free in commitment. I learned throughout my life that I could be really free by committing deeply and leaning all the way in. And there was a freedom in that actually, because I wasn't controlled by this need to be free. And in my commitment, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't have a mortgage. I couldn't have anything, right? Um, I couldn't, I, I didn't want to get into a lease on a, on a business building or anything like that. Like I didn't want the attachment. Yeah. Because, and, and I grew up with my mum just saying, oh, I want to travel the world, but I can't because I've got you kids and I'm married and all that. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't want that life. I want to be able to do what I want. And obviously, yeah. you know, a mortgage and a husband and, and kids and all this shit, you know, brings me down, weighs me down. So, you know, I formed that belief and it became unconscious and it got became buried. Mm. Um, and I also felt, you know, I had a fear of intimacy. And so commitment was difficult because every time I get close to someone, I didn't want to, I, I just wanted to back off and, 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 and not commit because I didn't want to be seen. And that was an intimacy thing. So there are other fears that are, that are tied to and connected to the, the commitment piece as well. And some men just, or people just don't know what they want. Right. And, and they, they, they think they want to be in a relationship, but they actually really don't want to. But because society says you, you should be. They do it. And, mm -hmm. and so they're being inauthentic, hence the, 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 the lack of commitment, the lack of really being present to the relationship because it's not something that they value and want. So you've got to be really ready, but you've got to know yourself. So you've got to explore yourself to know yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And for those who are in, you know, already in relationships and married, um, you know, I guess it just kind of loops back to that. You know, it's like, okay, if they're not, if you're now like in this like, okay, well, I feel like I've lost my identity because I've been wife and mom and, but I'm not Heather anymore. You know, it's like they're now on this self-discovery journey and inviting their partner and their husband to be on the journey with them. You know, I think that that's like helpful. <laughs> to their, it's going to be very helpful to their marriage yeah. or relationship yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you can, can you you know, love and date and be in relationships, you know, obviously, like we said at the beginning, like we're always going to be on a journey of like self-exploring, but, you know, I feel sometimes we, when we start this journey, maybe we think that we've gotten to a good place and we're like, but then we experience a very similar situation we get rejected or something like that, or we're don't feel like we've done enough yet to like heal ourselves or something. And so we're like putting off the relationship stuff. We keep, putting it off. Like, I feel like sometimes I'm sometimes maybe that's like why my dating behaviors are, are very inconsistent because I feel like sometimes maybe I haven't learned all the lessons I need to learn in order to like have like a dynamic relationship because I don't, although I encourage, you know, uncoupling if 
you've tried everything and all the things and, you know, your relationship just isn't working, but I essentially don't want that. Like, I don't want to get a divorce. I don't want my relationship to fail later on, you know? <laughs> so. Well, that's where the continued growth comes in and, and valuing yeah. growth together, right? I, know, I don't think anyone really wants to fail, right. uh, especially when they invest so much time and energy into a relationship. Yeah. But this is where the continued growth comes in. This is where, yeah. you know, working together and being honest with each other and, and opening uh, each other's, you know, one's heart to each other and being transparent with needs and, and changes that are happening and, and not ignoring that and not letting life get too busy and prioritizing the relationship. Otherwise, don't be in the relationship. Right. So there's that, there's that aspect as well. Absolutely, yeah. And just true communication. I mean, yeah. Can be the yeah. Meeting. Authentic, yeah. Real communication, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I know I could talk to you for a long time. I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> um, but any like anything that maybe you wanted to address or say, you know, talk about. No, no, just, uh, you know, everything we've spoke to, I think, uh, plays a, a critical role in our own development. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. Let, anything you want to um, share with us, promote, um, tell everyone where they can find you, all that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you can find me at stephanosafandos.com or any of my, my social media handles at stephanosafandos on uh, Instagram or TikTok or Facebook. Um, in terms of, you know, programs, my wife and I have some amazing programs. We have inner child workshops and programs that you can learn at your own pace. We also teach that live as well. We have a Be the Queen program, which is for uh, single ladies that are, are wanting to really heal their past and, and date really more authentically and, and, and really meet men that are in greater alignment with who they are and who they're becoming as well. We have a relationship course out there too. Um, if you're interested in working in a one-on-one -on -one capacity with me, there's a wait list at the moment, but you can apply at coachwithsteph.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have my book coming out next year as well, which is all around sexuality and intimacy. And it was meant to come out this year, but being a father, like, oh, i got to push that back a little bit. Being a new <laughs> father. So it'll be coming out next year. It's nearly finished, actually. Um, so I'm excited about that. But, yeah, all the things, you can just stay up to date on um, my website, sign up to my email list, and, yeah, easy. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to read your book. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. Congrats on newly fatherhood. <laughs> that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I know we'll connect further again, but thank you for everything that thanks, you do. Karen. And just, yeah, you're, you're changing lives. So I appreciate you. Thank yeah. you so much. Appreciate you as well. Thank you. <laughs> If you loved this episode, please download, share, rate, and review. If you are ready to step into that next level version of you and grow your business and bank account, it's time to unleash your goddess magic and chase life with Kelly. You can start this epic expansion journey by diving into the goddess magic course bundle found at chaselifetogether.com. Please connect with me on Instagram at chase life with Kelly. Join the Chase Life with Kelly Facebook community and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Till next time, create the life you crave, babe, and chase life with Kelly.